Ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to today's webinar. I'm John James and I'm your host for today's event. Today's webinar is brought to you for a partnership between Future Beef and Beef Central with funding from the Queensland Government and Meat and Livestock Australia. Today we have Dr Marie Bowen joining us. Marie is a ruminant nutrition scientist and is based in Rockhampton uh, with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. She's been leading a team of DAF staff, which has recently completed a project co-funded by DAF and MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia, to examine the productivity and profitability of high quality forage options for beef production in the Fitzroy Basin. Marie was raised on a beef cattle property in Western Queensland and also completed a PhD in beef cattle nutrition through the University of Queensland. Marie has also led sheep CRC nutrition projects at Longreach and once employed uh, as a dairy nutrition consultant down in Victoria. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Marie to our webinar today. Thank you, John. Well, it's great to have so many people registering to listen today. I just wanted to start, before I get into the presentation, uh, just start by finding out a little bit of information from the audience and John will lead us through that with a couple of poll questions. Great, so the first question is, are you a beef producer using high quality sown forages, a beef producer not yet using high quality sown forages or an industry representative. If you can click on the radio button to the left to indicate that would be great and I'll share those results. So there we go, we can see that a third are actually beef producers already using the high quality sown forages, just under half are industry representatives and the rest are beef producers not yet using them. And Marie, I know you've got a second one there, so I'll just put that up now too. And that question is, if you are using high quality sown forages, do you grow annual forage crops only, grow perennial legume forages only, or grow both types of forage? And I'll share that with everyone. So Marie, it seems as though we've almost got an even spread. Uh, although there's slightly more grow annual forage crops only, followed by those who are doing the perennial ones uh, and least are those who grow both of them. So there you go, that's a bit about what's happening with those who have joined the webinar with us today, Marie. Great, well today the purpose of this webinar is to give um, an overview of the key results conclusions and products produced from our recently completed project. As John mentioned in his introduction, we've just completed a project called High Output Forage Systems for Meeting Beef Markets Phase 2. And this was an MLA and DAF co-funded project. It started in 2011 and the final report was submitted to MLA um, in March this year. So um, the project has only recently been completed. And the overarching objective of our project was to examine the relative production and product production and profitability of key alternative forage options that could be used for either backgrounding or finishing beef cattle in the Fitzroy River catchment of Queensland. So that was our overarching objective, and this was our target area, the Fitzroy River Basin area, uh, from up north of um, Claremont down as far as the Troy Mondoan area. And in our project, we were really focusing on the higher quality soil types that would be capable of supporting um, a grain crop, just as easily as supporting a high quality forage crop or a high quality perennial legume grass pasture. The major part of this project was um, gathering data from commercial beef cooperator properties and we were really keen to, um, if you will, benchmark what was happening commercially rather than to go in and gather data on research station sites. So we wanted to measure and monitor what producers were doing in practice and the producers that we worked with, um, we selected producers who uh, we felt were good at their job and um, you know, great operators. We didn't ask producers to change their practices at all for our project, um, except for monitoring cattle live weight gain if they weren't already doing that. And we were just measuring and monitoring what was happening um, commercially, under normal commercial practice. So we worked with 12 um, different producers over the period 2011 to 2014 and we monitored 24 individual forage sites or paddocks over that time. Some of these were perennial paddocks or sites, so we monitored them over a number of years, up to three years um, over, or three or four years over the life of the project. We focused in on six key forage types, three annual forage crops, um, namely oats, forage sorghum and lab lab, and we looked at two high quality legume grass options being butterfly pea grass systems or echinograss systems 
and we also had perennial grass only sites which we used as a baseline to compare to the higher quality forage options. And we tried to spread these sites fairly evenly across the target area of the Fitzroy River Basin uh, with sites up in the north in the, the region we called CQ Open Downs type country, um, in the centre CQ Brigalow or Central Queensland Brigalow region and the southern Queensland Brigalow area around the Troon Wondowan area. And altogether over that um, period of the project we ended up with 31 individual data sets, so annual or part annual data sets um, over the life of the project. And at each of these um, paddocks or, or forage sites we took really detailed measurements. So the first thing we did was to set up weather stations where, um, wherever possible and I don't know if you can see my mouse moving there but this is um, a photograph of one of those weather stations. These were set up to monitor rainfall and temperature remotely at the site. We also took soil cores which is what this, the photograph below is showing and these were analysed for nutrient composition and we also um, determined water content of the soil at our sites at various times, uh, particularly for the annual forage crops at various times uh, throughout the period of monitoring. When it came to forage production we took measurements uh, to determine both biomass or total yield of forage in the grazed paddock and in exclosure sites and you can see some of these fenced exclosure sites in the photograph. These were areas that were fenced off so that cattle couldn't graze um, in those areas so that we could get an estimate of the potential total forage that was grown over the period um, of, of monitoring. And so we determined both total yield, both in and outside uh, the exclosures and took samples for forage quality as well and that being um, plant component, crude protein and dry matter digestibility. Uh, when it came to the animal production we took faecal samples uh, which were analysed by Fecal NIRS for diet quality, so that's the crude protein and dry matter digestibility of the diet selected by the cattle and as, as well as measuring live weight gain over the grazing period of course. And finally we connect, collected financial data from each of these paddocks and so that we could determine a gross margin for each paddock or each site. Um, and so just before I, I get into this slide in detail I should say that every single one of these so we had 31 data sets um, and 24 paddocks that were monitored. They each had their own complex story influenced by management, season and the market prices of the day and each of these sites is discussed in detail and the key findings and learnings if you will from these sites are presented in detail in our final report. Today I'm going to give a brief overview of a summary of the results and so that we can look at average averages and comparisons across forage types. And I'm going to start with looking at some key results for forage production for the different forage types and this table is showing forage biomass and also diet quality or quality of the diet selected by cattle. So if we look here at the annuals uh, which, oats, which are Oats Forage Sorghum and Lab Lab, in the first row these figures are the peak biomass measured in the grazed paddock and the figures below are the peak biomass mass measured in the exclosure site, so the ungrazed site, and these figures in the second row give an indication of the potential total forage growth that occurred in these annual paddocks. So this is the average across all of our oat sites, all of our forage sorghum sites and all of our lab lab sites. For the perennials the data is presented a little bit differently. This is the average yield over the entire grazing period, that annual grazing period for each of those forages and split up into the legume and the grass component. For the lacina, this figure is for the edible lacina component only. Now the key point I wanted to make here was that not unexpectedly the forage sorghum was out, the outstanding forage in terms of the greatest biomass produced um, and also not unsurprisingly oats was a standout in terms of diet quality, so diet crude protein and DMD in the diet selected by the, by the grazing cattle. The other point um, I wanted to highlight here is that the legumes, lab lab and the lacina grass um, pasture diets also provided um, a high quality diet for the grazing cattle, not too far behind the oats. Um, a key point to make as you know, from, from this data collection process looking at the soil and forage production was that a general finding across our sites and we think it's also um, a fair representation of what's happening generally across the region was that soil fertility was generally low and fertiliser application was also not common practice across these sites. And so our conclusion was from this that soil nitrogen and phosphorus are likely to be limiting for many annual forage crops in the region and phosphorus likely to be limiting for many perennial legume grass pastures. And this of course has implications for forage yield but also for quality of the diet provided uh, to the cattle. 
and this was quite evident in some of the sites that we monitored where particularly um, low soil nitrogen levels were reflected in low plant crude protein content, uh, particularly for some of the cereal crops. And we had a, a quite extreme example in the South Queensland Brigalow region for an oats crop grown in 2011. The soil nitrate nitrogen content was only 42 kilograms per hectare. And for that crop at the start of grazing, the green oats leaf was only 4.5% crude protein. Uh, which is extremely low and this is a photograph of that crop and you can see it's looking quite nitrogen efficient there and of those crude protein levels the performance of the cattle uh, is, is being affected. So we'll move on to um, the key animal production data averaged across uh, within forage types um, across all the sites and the key measure we were looking at here was kilograms of beef produced per hectare per annum and of course that figure is a combination of the average daily gain of the cattle over that grazing period uh, multiplied by the total grazing, um, total grazing days and the stocking rate, so the number of head per hectare. So this is the total live weight gain averaged across all forage sites. The figures in brackets below are the range across sites and you can see there was quite a range. I should mention here that um, particularly for these annual forages there was generally a varying area of perennial grass provided with the forage in the same paddock and this ranged from 17 to almost 87 percent I think was the highest number of the paddock was perennial grass so when um, we're expressing these figures we're expressing them per total grazing area and those areas included generally some proportion of perennial grass that was available to the cattle. In our project we um, had delta carbon analyses done of our faecal sample so that we could determine the proportion of high quality forage that the animals were eating relative to the grass and this confirmed that the cattle were generally eating very high proportions of the high quality forage um, until the end of that crop, we're reaching the end of that grazing period, the crop was um, going, going off and the cattle were starting to eat more perennial grass. So uh, that's just a, a point to keep in mind as we're looking at these figures. The major point uh, to make here is that Lakina is obviously the standout in terms of beef output in kilograms per hectare per year with the average figure of 198 kilograms of beef produced per hectare per annum from these pastures and that figure is more than two and a half times the average beef production from the perennial grass sites that we monitored. The other point of interest here is that you'll see that forage sorghum resulted in a fairly similar um, average total beef production to the other annuals oats and lab lab although almost twice as much forage biomass was produced by those forage sorghum crops and this was largely because these crops were generally poorly utilised. Which brings me to our next slide um, where I just wanted to highlight one of the, the major issues coming um, from observing and measuring um, these cooperator sites was that it was evident that grazing management was potentially limiting the productivity and profitability of some of these annual crops and particularly forage sorghum. It's notoriously difficult to manage to keep it in that high quality vegetative state and um, generally um, one, one of our sites was an exception but generally grazing started too late and the stocking rates were too low at these forage sorghum sites to maintain those crops in a nice vegetative state um, and provide a high quality diet to the cattle. So these are some photos of some of those um, sites that we monitored at the start of grazing and you can see the crops are already quite mature. A lot of that stem material was wasted and trampled and the quality of the diet the animals were consuming was lower than it could potentially have been and you know, resulting in lower beef production per hectare than what would have been expected um, if you just looked at those biomass figures. Um, another point uh, to make from the animal production uh, data was that quite a number of at quite a number of sites cattle were returned to perennial grass after grazing high quality forages and this happened for several reasons. In some cases weaners or growing stock were fed on high quality forages, particularly the oats, and then returned to perennial grass. Uh, but at other sites a proportion of cattle didn't finish during that grazing period and ret returned to perennial grass. And this is important because um, this is reducing the profit, potential profit margins from these crops largely because of uh, what we call compensatory gain effects where 
cattle return to perennial grasses lose that live weight advantage over the following wet season um, when cattle which didn't graze high quality forages will catch up, will have catch up growth um, over the wet season and so that um, live weight gain advantage is eroded and therefore the profit margin is also eroded. Another point arising from the animal monitoring um, part of the project was that it was evident in quite a number of cases that better monitoring of cattle weight gain over these periods of grazing on high quality forages would allow more optimal timing of sale and allow for cattle price margin to be maximised. Um, we had a number of cases where cattle either grew faster than anticipated and in some cases slower than anticipated and, and this has negative consequences in terms of timing of sale and price margin. In, some, in one particular case about a third of the cattle grazing a high quality crop were unsuitable for either feedlot entry market where they were intended to go um, or the abattoir and so this resulted in quite a poor, resulted in a negative price margin which is the sale minus the purchase price of cattle in dollars per kg live weight and so that had a big impact on the gross margin. Um, and in a large number of other cases the proportion of cattle just didn't finish on the forage and would return to perennial grass. And so this is a spot where we're going to pause and welcome questions before we go on with the gross margin and financial aspect of the data. So I'll hand over to you John. Great, thanks Marie. You're doing really well. Um, spot on for time, which is great. So folks, this is where you have your opportunity to uh, ask some questions or some comments. So we've got a few coming in. So the first one is, uh, so Marie, you mentioned that uh, there were sites on I think a dozen different properties. So did you have an equal number of sites for each forage type? Uh, yes, John. No, no, we didn't. We tried to. That was our objective. But I'm just finding our figures here, which will... Um, which will tell me the exact numbers. We had some difficulty in finding some sites just because of the seasons um, at that particular uh, time of year and the years that we were monitoring. But we ended up with eight oats data sets, five forage sorghum data sets, two lab lab, six lacina, three butterfly pea grass and seven perennial grass data sets. So there were some forage types like the lab lab which were less well represented and the butterfly pea as well. So that was un unfortunate but um, as I mentioned seasonal conditions at the time meant that sometimes forages weren't planted when they were intended to be. Sure uh, and there's another question here about the season actually. Uh, so how did the good and bad seasons over the years um, influence the, the project and the data coming in? Yes, that's a good question, John. It certainly had an effect. We actually had some very high rainfall um, years or seasons over the project, which resulted in some quite high crop yields for the annuals. Um, and people might have seen some quite high average yields for the oats and forage sorghum in one of the earlier slides. So we did have have some of those seasonal effects influencing our data. And I'll talk a little bit later on about some other work we did to try and look at results over more long-term seasonal conditions in some modelling work that we did. But certainly the seasons um, had an influence on the results we got in the co at the cooperator sites. Sure. So would you happen to know the average rainfall over the seasons, asks one of our attendees. <laughs> well, that's quite a complicated question to answer. I, I go into some detail about this in our final report, which will be available from the MLA website. But because we monitored so many regions, it was hard to make one general comment about the rainfall being below average or above average because it did vary over the years and for different sites. You know, rainfall was patchy, and you know, we resulted. You know, we had some really high rainfall for some forage crops in some sites, but they're not in other areas for that same season for instance. So it's, I can't really give one figure but for the individual regions and sites we go into some detail about the rainfall in the final report. Sure, okay thanks. Got a few more questions so we'll just cover those now. Um, were the production results similar for all the breed types? Asks Lex. And I gather that that would mean cattle breeds. If yes. Generally we didn't see, we didn't have enough sites to really look at breed differences but that certainly didn't seem to be the overriding factor on the um, cattle production results. It was really the quality and the yield of the forage that was having the biggest influence. I mean another um, 
area that is important is the age of the cattle grazing as well, but we really didn't see any standout differences between either breeds or younger or older cattle going onto these forages. It seemed like the overriding effect was the quality um, of the forage in terms of daily live weight gain and then the, the yields as well when we're looking at kilograms of beef produced um, per hectare from those sites. With given more data and replication, um, some of those breed differences and age differences would have been drawn out, but that wasn't what we were looking for in this particular project. Good. Oh, we do have some more questions, but I think they may be covered by the sections coming up. So how about you move to the next section now? Thanks, Marie. Thanks, John. So we'll move now into, I guess, the bottom line, the important end result of growing these forages, which is the gross margins. And what I'm presenting here in this table is the gross margin for each paddock or forage site. And these are averaged across those years of data, um, years and sites within each forage. And once again, the range across sites is in brackets below the, the, uh, the number above. Um, I just should make a point here about the methods that we used so that we could determine a comparative gross margin for the perennial forages. We used a, pro a process called amortisation. Uh, which enabled us to determine an average annual forage cost for these perennial legumes. So obviously a lot of the um, establishment costs are up front, but then the forage may have a life of 20 to 30 years for Lakina or you know, 5 to 10 years for butterfly pea, depending on the site. So an average annual cost for those forage costs is attributed to these sites over the life the expected life of the forage. And so that's how we're able to come up with an average annual forage cost for the perennials and um, an annual gross margin with which to compare to the annual forages. So that's just a bit of methodology. The primary point from this slide is that Lakina was the standout in terms of gross margin with the average across all the sites that we monitored being $184 per hectare per year. So that's for the years that we we're monitoring obviously 2011 to 2014 and as you can see this average gross margin was almost twice that from the perennial grass sites. The other um, key point from this slide is that you'll see there is a big range in these gross margins across the data sets within each forage as well as across forage sites and of course there are a number of factors influencing gross margin that are contributing to this, this variability. Of course you know, as well as the forage and beef production in terms of kilograms per hectare from each paddock, the forage costs are also influencing gross margin and also the cattle price margin. And in our calculations and analyses, we found that really these gross margins are very sensitive to cattle price margin. So that's the sale price in dollars per kg life weight minus the purchase price of cattle. And, um, and obviously fluctuations in those price margins um, has a big effect on the gross margin. So management, you know, individual management at each site, seasonal factors and market factors are all influencing these gross margins. And in this graph, um, this is just demonstrating that variability in price margin, so cattle price margin. Um, the red lines are showing the, the project period, so the period over which we're measuring data. And cattle were valued on the basis of the market prices available when they went onto the forage and when they came off. And this graph is just showing um, the sale and purchase price. The black line is Dinmore grass-fed ox price in cents per kg live weight. And the blue and yellow lines are sale yard prices for Gracemere and Roma steers. So that's just giving you an indication that sometimes that those price margins were negative and sometimes positive and that will have a big effect on the gross margin. Um, so I guess the, the next point to make is that these gross margins were only the first step in determining the effect of sown forages on overall farm profit and they're showing us whether the forage activity makes a profit or a loss at the paddock level but to determine the value of these on forage systems to the whole farm or business, you need a more complete economic analysis. And um, what these are are whole farm economic case studies or whole farm profit budgets. And these analyses determine the value of the sown forage system to the whole farm or business relative to other alternatives for that area of, of land or that paddock. So for instance, the other alternatives might be perennial grass, sowing that paddock back to perennial grass or leaving as perennial grass or growing a grain crop. 
and the way these analyses work is by comparing the net profit generated by these alternative operating systems and a really important point is that they incorporate some additional costs of growing forage that aren't captured in the gross margin analyses and these are changes in unpaid labour, in herd structure and in capital or overheads. So they are capturing more of the true costs of growing forage um, in the comparison to other alternative uses of that land. So we conducted six of these whole farm case studies with six of our producer cooperators. These are quite detailed analyses so we weren't able to do it with every single cooperator. What we looked for was um, cooperators who were growing a number of different forage types and also some cooperators who were growing grain crops as well. And our key conclusions from these analyses were that the perennial legging grass pastures and particularly Lakina under current market and cost conditions have a significant economic advantage over both annual forage crops and perennial grass pastures. However, they weren't as profitable as grain cropping where grain cropping was a feasible alternative. On the other hand, the annual forage crops generally only added value to the beef enterprise if the opportunity cost of planned and unpaid labour were excluded. So more marginal um, results for the whole value provided to the whole farm business for those annual forage crops. So I'll just move on now to our constructed or modelled scenarios. As I said earlier, um, the cooperator site results in terms of the gross margins and also the whole farm case studies uh, in a way are very influenced by the current market and cost conditions, they're influenced by the individual management uh, of the cooperators and um, you know and at each site and they're influenced by long-term seasonal conditions as well so you know the season at the time. So what we were keen to do was to try and do some modelling to look at potential production and profitability figures using long-term average seasonal conditions um, and long-term market prices. And we also assumed standard best management practices as well, just to see uh, whether the results were any different to those average figures and trends we were seeing from the cooperator sites. And what we found from these um, analyses were that, and I'm not presenting them in detail today because time is limiting, but these are available in full in both our forage book, which I'll talk about later, uh, a book that we've produced and the final report. But generally these results supported those from the cooperator sites. We had the same average ranking of forages for gross margin across the different forage types. Uh, the exception was perennial grass, which actually ranked higher at the cooperator sites than what it did in our modelling exercise. And this was primarily due to um, the higher stocking rates that we used in practice at cooperator sites compared to the more conservative stocking rates we assumed in our model scenarios and therefore higher beef production per hectare at the cooperator sites for perennial grass. So I'll just conclude this aspect of the talk um, in summarising some of our top tips to maximise productivity and profitability of sown forages and I guess firstly we'd suggest asking the right questions before you, you decide to plant forage at all. What is the purpose of the forage? What forage types are best suited to my land type and production system? What sort of forage and cattle production might I expect from the forages? And what is the likelihood of the forage improving my business profitability? And the tools that we've produced in this project, which I'll talk more about later, um, can assist and provide information to help answering some of these questions. Secondly, it's important to plan ahead, use best practice agronomy and animal management and after the exercise is finished, make sure you collect the data and do the sums to measure whether or not the, the forage has been a success in the way you hoped it would be. So this was where I hope to move on to another poll and have a short break before moving on to the next, the final section of the, the talk, John. Sure, so uh, we'll have yeah, a lot more questions for you, uh, Marie, in just a moment, but folks, quick question, do the project results confirm what you already thought or knew, contrast with your own experience and figures, or unsure you need more information? So we're curious to know how, I guess, today's presentation has resonated with your existing experience. So I can see a lot of people have voted, so I'll close that off shortly, so in three Two, one. 
and I'll share those results. So Marie, there we go. So two thirds uh, believe that you've confirmed what they already thought on you, so you've validated that for them, which is great. Uh, about a third, 32% are saying that they're unsure, they need a little bit more information and um, there's probably just one person saying it here contrasts a bit with their own experience. So it might be useful if they type that in the Q&A panel. So Marie, are you willing to take some questions now? I, yes, that's fine, John. Great, okay. So folks, you've been um, very industrious with your typing. So. Marie, there's a couple of questions to do uh, with your use of the legume. So the first one is, did the soil fertility improve in the legume crops? That, um, we, we couldn't really, the length of our monitoring period wasn't really long enough to look for um, changes in soil quality over the period of our monitoring. Um, we do have detailed data looking at how the soil quality at these sites um, compares to the annuals, for instance, but really there was, um, there's not enough information to, from this project to determine whether or not, or to show that the legumes are improving the soil type, although there's plenty of other scientific data out there um, looking at that aspect, but that wasn't really the objective of this, this project. Uh, okay, never mind, because another one of our attendees is asking, yeah, was the available soil nitrogen measured? And if so, what was the ongoing comparison from the legume mix versus non-legume pastures? So obviously there's a bit of interest there. Yes, and we can provide some more information about that after the session if, um, if people are interested in sending us an email because um, it's, it is difficult to measure the available nitrogen perennial systems. Our agronomist could answer this question, our project agronomist. Uh, Stuart Buck could answer this question much better than I, but I believe in the perennial systems, the grass are actively soaking up the nitrogen that is made available by the legumes. So you're not act you're seeing it in a grass response rather than measuring it in in the soil. But that wasn't something we actively set out to show in this particular project. Mm, okay. Well, uh, one of the attendees has actually commented that there seems to be a lot, of in, a lot of interest in the forage production project that you've just run. So are there plans to run another project um, to continue and expand some of this work? We hope to do that and we're developing up a, a proposal at present, but um, certainly we've had a very, very good response from the producers that we've worked with and, and at our field days and um, we've had a lot of interest from industry. So we're really keen to continue this work and to build on what we've done, most certainly. Right, okay. Good -o. So here's a few more specific questions. I know we do have another section, but it's a short one. So how do you determine adequate stocking rate of perennial grass and the legume pastures? Um, so when we did our modeling, modeled scenarios or our constructed scenarios, we worked with industry um, recommendations for long-term sustainable stocking rates. Um, and when we worked at our cooperator sites, we were measuring what the cooperators, the stocking rates that the cooperators used. And of course, these stocking rates were closely linked to the season and the amount of grass that was grown, as well as individual management practices. I don't know whether that properly answers that question, but if more detail is um, or, or discussion is desired, then please send me an email and we can we can provide more information there. Sure. Uh, so I'm still just ploughing through the questions here, just going down the list. So, uh, so did the FNIRS uh, DMD percentage and the CP percentage, and maybe you can explain what those acronyms are, Marie, uh, recording of individual crops locations tell a predictable story? Um, Yes, they did in many ways. So, crude, so CP is crude protein, and DMD is dry matter digestibility. And yes, we because we collected very detailed data, and we also um, did fecal delta carbon measurements. We could relate the dietary, the, you know, the quality of the diet back to the proportion of high quality forage that was being consumed, except for sorghum, of course, because um, it doesn't work using that methodology. So we could see that diet quality was closely linked to um, the proportion of high quality forage in the diet and as the grazing period uh, lengthened, so you got towards the end of the grazing period and cattle were consuming more grass pasture and there were less of the high quality leaf components available, you could see the diet quality was dropping off. Because we also um, 
some of our hardworking teams sorted the forage into leaf and stem components, we could also see that the quality of the diet and live weight gain was closely linked to the amount of green leaf available in both the forage crops and the perennial um, pasture sites. So all of this is predictable. What um, was surprising for us was the very low um, both plant tissue crude protein in some of the cereal crops and, um, and the corresponding diet crude protein measures and that was linked to some low soil fertility measures as I've already discussed. Mm. Uh, Marie, did any of the sites use controlled grazing? Um, so rotational grazing, I gather that means. Um, for the perennial sites, um, cattle were generally, um, you know, th no, there was there was no um, strict cell grazing at any of the sites that we monitored. No, some of the forage crops were rotationally grazed, um, and at all of our perennial sites, cattle came and went, and, and pastures were spelled periodically. But there was no strict cell grazing. I hope I've, I've got the that question correct, uh, interpreted Good correctly. But, yep. Thank you. Uh, so can you tell us more about the types of forage sorghum that you used? So are they the sweet forage, the BMRs, Sudan crosses? Mm. Look, there was a wide um, there was a wide range and really we just monitored what our what the producer cooperators that we engaged were growing. We didn't specify, so there was a wide range and those um, I won't and there are a range of varieties and I won't go into them all now except to say they are in documented in detail in our final report and in our forage book um, which as I'll show later you can download that from as a PDF from the Future Beef website you can get a hard copy email me and we can send you a hard copy or you can come to one of our field days which are in the first week of June and get a copy and these give all these details for each and every one of our sites um, that, that we've monitored. Good. So Marie, I think you've done really well answering questions there. I still have a few more to go, but how about we pass back to you so you can uh, give us the third and final section of your presentation, although I'm not seeing that on my screen at the moment. Uh, right, I'll just have to, to find where we're, we are up so, to. Good. So, right, so we're ready to go. John, can you see? The right slide from your end? No. <laughs> uh, so for me, if I click on the little blue flower down the bottom, that uh, brings me back to the GoToWebinar screen. And if you click the play button, I'm guessing it is, to show your application. Ah, uh, yes, I How think How is that, John? Is that working? I can see it thinking, thinking. Ah, great, we can see that. And if you can just make that um, fill the screen again, that'll be great. Yeah, so click uh, resume slideshow, I guess. Yep, that's it. Is that working? Yes, I see the working. modeling and DST development slide, which was too, yeah. Yes, right, you're on the right so one there now. We're ready to continue. Yep. Excellent. Well, John and and folks, what I really uh, was wanting to do now was just give a very brief overview of another aspect of our project. We don't have time to go into details in this talk, but uh, I just wanted to make people aware that we did this aspect of work. Um, what we were wanting to do in this modelling and decision support tool area was to look at the available forage and animal models that were currently out there available and to look at whether these could be usefully used as predictive tools um, for your particular region and, and soil type within the Fitzroy River catchment because there's really good soil and climate data available for the Fitzroy River catchment region um, where you can pinpoint your exact location and for your soil type and the long term your 100 year climate for your region. Um, if you've got good data to then predict forage and animal production you should be able to have a fairly reasonable prediction um, of of those um, comparative figures for your for your specific location. So that was our idea. We used the data from our field sites to evaluate these forage and animal models to see whether or not they were predicting accurately um, across the region. 
And just to briefly summarise what we found um, with regards to the forage models, we looked at GRASP for predicting perennial grass biomass and it did a great job of predicting both grazed and ungrazed biomass. We looked at APSIM for predicting the biomass of the annuals, oats, sorghum and lab lab and unfortunately APSIM wasn't able to predict the biomass of these forages satisfactorily, particularly wasn't able to predict the effect of grazing on these forages um, and also underpredicted the ungrazed forage sorghum and lab lab biomass for our sites. So um, that was an issue there. We looked at grass feed as the animal model. Um, it's based on the Australian feeding standards and has largely been developed um, for temperate or under temperate systems. And unfortunately, grass feed underpredicted the life weight gain of cattle grazing all of our forage crops, including oats, which was um, une unexpected, particularly for the oats, and meant that we weren't able to use it reliably um, in decision support tool development. However, we did develop a prototype decision support tool as a demonstration or an example of what might be possible if these models could be improved, but extra data and work uh, would be required to improve these models before uh, we could provide a useful tool that would be available for industry. So just um, to move on to the key products or tools produced as part of this project, there are two main products available for um, producer and consultant use that we have produced. The first is a hard copy book called Feeding Forages in the Fitzroy and we also have this available as a PDF which can be downloaded from the Future Beef website and I believe John will send out a link um, to that to that PDF after the webinar finishes. What this book does is collate general um, agronomy information, cattle grazing management and production information um, for the key forages that we've looked at in our project at the cooperator sites as well as other options as well, other forage options that we didn't uh, study at the cooperator sites. We give example gross margins and economic information in this guide and we also give a brief summary of the data and results from our cooperator sites including a one page summary of each of the sites um, giving information like the variety of forage, the sowing date, the production, just a snapshot of the key data um, for each of those sites. So that's included in the guide as well. We've also produced forage, what we call forage gross margin calculators, the Microsoft Excel spreadsheets and there's one um, specific to each of the regions, um, that each of those three regions that I spoke about earlier. These currently have the example gross margins that we calculated in our constructed or model scenarios but the inputs can be changed for your particular production systems and relevant to your business so that you can calculate your own forage gross margins using these spreadsheets and these are available from the Future Beef website as well and John will send out a link to those if people are interested in downloading them. And I also wanted to give a plug for our field days coming up in the first week of June. Um, so Claremont, Marin, Taroon, 2nd, 3rd and 4th of June and we'll be giving a more detailed overview of these results and, and more conclusions um, than what I can fit into this session today, more information. We will have um, a number of our project team there including our agronomist and economist to um, talk more about their speciality areas and provide more information and we'll also be working through how to use these forage gross margin spreadsheets as well at the day so we'd welcome any more registrations for our, our field days. And finally I'd just like to conclude by acknowledging the financial support of MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia and particularly want to thank the producer cooperators that worked with us on this project. Uh, the project wouldn't have been possible without our great cooperators who freely provided information and access to their properties and uh, we're greatly indebted, indebted to our great cooperators and as well just to thank our DAF project team. We had a large team of folks making this project um, work and I just want to acknowledge my colleagues. And I've just got my contact details here on this last slide. Please feel free to contact me directly if you'd like any more information. And as I said, our products, our extension products will be available from the Future Beef website and our final report should be available from the MLA website soon. There's been a bit of a delay um, in that report going up there but it should be available for download fairly soon. And that um, 
brings me to the end of my presentation, John. That's great. Thanks, Marie. We have a number of questions for you. So some regarding the financial aspects for a start. So did you calculate the Lucina startup costs and ongoing cost of Lucina management in your model? Yes, yes we did at both the cooperator sites and we did that in the same way for our model sites. So um, as I was trying to explain earlier too, I may not have done a good job, but we used a process called amortisation to attribute those, um, those initial high establishments or startup costs, as well as any ongoing maintenance costs, you know, particularly for Lakina with chopping and fertiliser. They were, um, this is a simplified way of explaining what, what was done, but they were averaged over the life, expected life of that forage. So um, depending on the actual site that we were monitoring, that the expected life may have been 20 years, it may have been 30 years for Lakina, uh, it may have been 5 to 10 years for Butterfly Pea. So um, that was certainly calculated. Um, and that um, yeah, has been incorporated into those average annual um, forage costs and gross margins that were presented. Great, thanks Marie. Now would improvement in annual crop management make a major difference in the gross margins? So for example more fertiliser and better grazing management in oats? No, I, I don't think so because across our sites we saw a range in management. In this talk I was highlighting some of the potential issues that we saw at some of our sites but um, we had you know, a range of management across uh, the sites that we saw and um, I don't believe that that would have made a, a major difference. Some of the overriding um, factors were things outside of uh, people's control in many cases with the season, but also the cattle price margin had a big influence as well. So while um, optimising your, um, using best practice agronomy and animal management helps you maximise your chances of a profitable outcome, it's not the only factor. So it's important to be doing that as well, um, but it wasn't the only factor determining gross margin. I hope I've answered that. Clearly. <laughs> yep, okay. Uh, now, regarding the cattle that you were using in the study, what percentage of the cattle slaughtered may have been PCAS approved um, and was a premium received? None of the cattle that we monitored in our sites happened to be um, PCAS approved. There were some cattle that went for MSA grading, but none were PCAS approved, and that was just by chance with the cooperators that we studied. Actually, John, I'd, I should, I'd just like to go backwards because I thought of another point to help explain the previous question, if people can still remember what that was, but it was about whether or not um, better management would have changed the result for the annual. And um, I guess what was influencing my answer for that last question was also our modelling, our constructed scenarios. So we assumed best practice management in those scenarios and the profitability, um, th there was still the same ranking of annuals with regard to the perennials in those where we assumed best practice management. And one difference that we did see that I didn't highlight in my talk was with forage sorghum. Um, we did get better gross margins in our constructed scenarios than in than the average in practice at the cooperator sites and that was because we assumed um, that grazing management was very spot on with um, uh, with keeping that forage sorghum in a vegetative state. so But it still wasn't enough to change the ranking relative to the perennials. So mm, sorry for okay, jumping about you. there, but I thought that might be help to clarify that, that previous question. No, that's good, thanks. Uh, was the period for measuring weight gain the same for both the annual and perennial forages? Uh, what we did in terms of weight gain was we monitored um, the cattle weight change over the length of the grazing period. So for annuals it was as long as the crop was grazed. So um, you know the minute cattle entered that paddock until they left that paddock and for the perennials it was whatever um, weight gain happened as cattle came and went from that paddock within an annual period. So all of our results are expressed per annum. So for annual forage crops um, that beef production is kilograms of beef per hectare per annum because that was generally the only grazing that occurred in that paddock um, during the year and then for the perennials that was also divided up into an annual period as well. 
So it was a total beef production or the total live weight gain that was added to cattle um, from that paddock during a 12 month, 365 day period. Good, we're running out of time, so a quick one here. Was any sulphur supplementation available when grazing the sorghum crops so as to increase the crop utilisation? That, I don't believe that occurred at any of our sites from memory, so um, yeah, that wasn't something that came out as um, being a big um, issue that producers focused on. Um, so that, yeah, that, but I'd have to go back and check the individual sites to see if there were any sites that supplements were provided. But from memory, I can't recall um, that being done. Sure. Okay. And I'll just finish on this last one. Uh, do you think the results would be similar in other regions and locations? I think you would have to um, have a look at our results and see whether you thought the the production levels that we measured were relevant for your area. In some cases it may be different, particularly with regards to, um, you know, Lakina being grown out of, you know, further south for instance, or annual forage crops being grown um, in the Darling Downs region for instance. So there could be some uh, differences there in the sorts of production you'd expect and also with, with cattle price margins and so forth. But I think the general principles um, coming from our work would be relevant and transferable to other areas. The, the gross margin calculators that we have produced enable you to input your own estimates, your own best estimates for the sort of production you'd expect in your area as well as the relevant cattle prices and so forth and also costs of planning um, and maintaining the forage. So you can add that information that you feel might be more relevant for your area and then use those tools to look at how those gross margins might differ for your area. But I think certainly the general principles probably apply um, more broadly than just our Fitzroy River catchment area. Mm, great. Okay, thanks Marie. We have run out of time. So folks, if you still have a burning question that hasn't been answered, you are free to contact Marie after the webinar uh, and get that information from her. So Marie, thank you very much for your yeah, wonderful presentation today with all that uh, detail in it. So thanks for sharing your insights with us. Uh, and of course, thanks to all our attendees for coming along and asking so many questions. That's great. Now folks, don't forget that you, you can receive daily emails from the Beef Central crew. If you haven't already signed up, just pop over uh, to their website and do so. Now folks, uh, don't forget to visit our Future Beef website as well. So it's your one-stop shop for beef information across Northern Australia. Uh, and in due course, that's where you'll find the webinar recording. Uh, and I said earlier, I'll certainly send everyone who registered an email with the magic link for that recording. Uh, and while you're at our website, don't forget to sign up to receive our e-bulletins by just uh, clicking in this little sign up box down here. So folks, um, of course, we'll be evaluating it and we'll send you out that link as well. So at this stage, I'd like to thank yeah, the, um, the great presentation from you today, Marie, and the great audience who've come along from lots of different locations in Australia. So folks, it's been great having you here today. Thanks for joining us and all the best until we meet again soon. Hooroo for now. <laughs>